notes about this. Oh, whoops. Crap. Okay, this is going to take a while to come in, so I'll just talk over it. Um, Dimitri Mendeleev made our first successful periodic table. He wasn't the first guy to try. He was just the first guy that actually, you know, got credit for it. Uh, and he basically laid down a bunch of little note cards and found that if he laid them out in order of increasing atomic mass, that he found these properties that kept repeating over and over and over again. Um, one of which was... He, uh, he did atomic uh, radius, the size of the atom, and he found that as, you went a, as, he, as he went through his list of all the elements that they had at this point arranged by mass, that he would start out up here, and then it would go down, 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 and then all of a sudden it would shoot up, and then it would go down, 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 down again. And what this is is you know the trend that he found between atomic mass and uh, atomic radius and so he said well okay maybe if I made you know this down a row and then at this element right here I started another row and so he kind of just organized it out and it looked a lot like the periodic table we have now um, except of course it was arranged by mass and so there was a couple of, of little problems and he was back in the mid 1860s or late 1860s, and so a lot of the elements hadn't even been discovered. The noble gases didn't didn't uh, exist to scientists at all yet, and uh, but he was smart enough that he left spaces for those elements, and he actually was lucky enough to get to live long enough to see that yeah he was right. Fast forward to you know a little bit more modern. They now know about the nucleus and about protons and neutrons, and this guy Henry Mosley comes along and says, "Hey, Mendeleev, periodic table looks great." But I bet we can iron out some of the kinks that you have if instead of arranging them by atomic mass, we arrange them by atomic number, number of protons. And this is the periodic table that we use today. So the four trends that I want you guys to know uh, are coming up. The first one is atomic radii, or just the size of the atom. And the way that it was measured, since an actual atom, you know, the edge of the electron cloud is kind of fuzzy and kind of hard to tell where it, in, where it ends, that you take two identical atoms, bond them together, and then take half of the distance between their two nuclei to figure out the atomic radius. And the trend that was found was the biggest elements were down here at the bottom left of the periodic table, and they got smaller as you went up, and then helium was the smallest element. And the reason that it increases as you go down is because you have more energy levels. And the reason that it decreases as you go across is because of the attraction to the nucleus, actually specifically the protons in the nucleus, and those electrons zipping around. As you get more protons, those electrons get more drawn into the nucleus, and so the whole thing becomes more compacted. So that's why it gets smaller as you go across, but bigger as you go down. So that francium is actually the biggest element on the periodic table, and helium is the smallest. So, there's just a general trend. Who's bigger? Sodium or rubidium? Well, because rubidium is closer to francium, rubidium wins. And y'all pause this because I'm just going to fly right through it. Sodium or sulfur? Sodium is closer to francium, so sodium wins. And then sulfur or tellurium? Tellurium is lower down on uh, the group, so tellurium is bigger. Then you have ionization energy, and ionization energy is the amount of energy that gets put into an atom to remove an electron. And if you need an analogy, imagine that um, an atom is the gas station worker and you need a pack of gum. How much money do you have to pay the gas station worker to get that pack of gum? That's what ionization energy is. If the atom was the gas station worker and the electron was the pack of gum, and energy is money. Uh, so that's what ionization energy is, and so the elements that you would have to pay more money to to get their pack of gum would be the guys that hang on to their uh, electrons a lot more strongly, and that's your nonmetals. Your nonmetals don't want to get rid of their electrons, so you're going to have to give them a whole lot more money to get them to get rid of those electrons. 
Whereas the metals, specifically the group one metals, they really want to get rid of that one lonely little valence electron they have, so they're not going to hang on to it very uh, tightly, and so you're not going to have to pay them much money to get rid of their electron. So general trend here. So who's got the higher ionization energy? Lithium or fluorine? Well, fluorine is a non-metal, so it really wants to hang on to its electron, so it's going to have a much higher ionization energy. Calcium or phosphorus? Again, phosphorus is the non-metal, so phosphorus. Barium or lithium? Both of these guys are metals, so who's going to hang on to their electrons more and is thus going to require more convincing to get rid of their electrons? Well, since lithium, the electrons are closer into the nucleus, lithium holds on to its electrons more. So lithium, in this case, is going to have a higher ionization energy. Then you have the opposite, and that's electron affinity. And this is the amount of energy that will be given off, released to the environment, when the element receives an electron. And so the elements that are going to have the highest get the most excited or be willing to pay the most money to get an electron are your non-metals. Your metals really couldn't care less about getting more electrons. They're trying to get rid of the ones that they have. And so their electron affinity is going to be very low. So it looks like this, where you have over here, your halogens have the highest electron affinities because they really, really, really want to get one more electron. So they'll pay you a lot of money for it. Um, and then coming down, it pretty much decreases heading down that way. So the general trend is the highest electron affinities are up here. Actually, the arrows should be pointing at fluorine. So, who's got the higher electron affinity? Germanium or carbon? Carbon wins that battle. Indium or iodine? Halogens always win this battle, so iodine. And magnesium or fluorine? Fluorine is the biggest and baddest of them all, so fluorine, yay fluorine. The last one we're gonna talk about is electronegativity. And all of the other periodic trends applied to the element in its pure state. Electronegativity only applies when the element is actually in a compound, not by itself. And so electronegativity is basically a measure of how much of a bully is that element when it comes to electrons. If you think of electrons as toys and atoms as little kids, the bully is the one that has the higher electronegativity or the one that hogs all of the electrons when it's in a compound. Fluorine, biggest bully of them all, was just arbitrarily given a value of four and all the others, all the other elements were given a value based on how they behaved next to fluorine or how much fluorine was able to bully up on them. So this is a table of electronegativity that came straight out of your book. Here's the web elements picture. That's the general trend. So who's got the higher electronegativity? Strontium or beryllium? Beryllium is higher up, therefore closer to fluorine, so beryllium wins. Phosphorus or oxygen? Oxygen is right next to fluorine, so it's gonna win. And silicon or chlorine? Chlorine is right next to fluorine, so chlorine wins. And that, ladies and gents, is all I've got. How'd you like?